just going to bubble up on the other side. So we'll take a simple example. Um, if you take the program damage and you give it a whole lot of operators, everything is operators. You know, all you need is three operators who can do anything. Well, it's really hard to read. It just looks like gibberish. You know. On the other hand, if you take the program and you just have operators of that, you know, must have no operators, then you end up with these really long, verbose constructs to do the simplest thing. You know, you're, you're just trying to, you know, add, multiply a few numbers and assign them to a variable, but you have to stretch your way out. So the trick is to find the balance. Somewhere in the middle between there is the perfect way of phrasing something. And that's going to change between languages, you know. My way is not your way, my language is not your language. Just find balance. By the way, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Not that you necessarily have any at this hour, but... Yeah. Well, actually, the waterbed theory is interesting. We're saying the conservation of complexity. Isn't it more like uh, the entropy never decreases? You can always increase complexity for no gain. <laughs> yes, you can. You, you can. you can. What are you saying is you can always increase complexity. It's absolutely true. You for can no increase gain. complexity for no purpose whatsoever, right. just for the fun of it. Some languages, water bed up. some languages, I have the feeling that they do that just for the heck of it. But. Microsoft's an idea. Maybe so. I won't name any names. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, reuse. Another principle. So, when you're designing a language, generally, if you take a feature and you use the same syntax for another feature, it'll be an advantage. So, if you had a language that used like standard block structure for a while, loop, but then used like Ada style if then end if structure for an if block, it would be incredibly annoying. You would never be able to figure out what the pattern is. You'd always be trying to remember. The, well, let's see. Okay, this is a switch. So now did that use block structure or did that use? That's horrible. So you try to reuse structures anywhere you can. It makes the language more consistent, easier to remember, easier to use, easier to teach, all those great things. And the set of repeated structures that you use throughout the language is what we tend to call the syntactic conventions. It becomes the syntactic conventions just by the fact that it's in existence. But on the other side, there's always a flip side to every principle. The human mind is designed to filter out small differences. So wherever possible, it will only focus on the big differences. So I'll take an example from English. If the word cat was actually tall, that was the word for it, you would find people constantly having to correct each other. No, no, I, I said that Johnson's going to be tall, not dog, tall. So you try to, in a particular context, increase the distinctions as much as possible to make it, make it easy to see between them. Now, the designer trick is to build in visual clues to the language. Now, we found a few things when we went back at Perl and examined the syntax that were irritating. Like, this keyword eval was used for two completely different things. One was to catch errors, and the other was actually to take a string and execute it as a piece of code. So you could create a string of code and execute it right there. So we split those out to two different keywords now. Uh, the same with for and loop, two different kinds of looping constructs. We use different names for them now. And sub and method. The for, the keyword sub was used in all objects and non object oriented code, and it's it's just nicer to know that it has a different word when it's really something that's different. It makes it easier to tell where you are and what you're doing. So, with the two principles standing opposite each other, distinction and reuse. Now, you see, you want to reuse syntactic structures anywhere you can, 
impossible. But on the other hand, if you reuse too much, then you're losing friction and things start to blur together. So you kind of have to stand there on the dividing line between the two and, again, find the balance. It's like surfing language design. is a principle that not all languages value. It's, it's one that Perl has always highly valued, but um, that's partly because of the community, partly because of the people who are designing it. So, programmer freedom has always been a big value in Perl development. And that is, um, you have freedom to use powerful features in any way you choose to do. Now, that also means you have the responsibility to use them up. But what Perl has always done is had customs, not laws. This is what you should do. This is the nice thing to do. This is helpful. But not, this is the only way you can write the structure. Other languages just take different routes. But for us, what that means is we're not, when we're considering features, we're not going to reject a feature just because someone can use it stupidly. Anybody could use a language feature stupidly. Now, if, if there's other reasons to reject a feature, yeah, sure, we'll go ahead and say, okay, if, if it is a terrible feature and people can use it stupidly. Yeah. On the other hand, despite the fact that we're willing to put in things evil features. We're not about making evil features hard to use. <laughs> a good example of this is, um, let's see, a lot of people wanted the ability to access any variable outside the current subroutine from the calling scope. So we'll say, sure, well, you can do that. We're just going to really give you a, like, a really long two string to do it so that, you know, the, first, the baby Perl programmers aren't going to do it. The really experienced guys who know what they're doing and um, are willing to do a little bit of analysis stuff with Perl. Sure, go ahead. If you burn yourself, it's your own fault. Now, the problem is, even if you're going to give programmers that kind of freedom, you have to build a very flexible language. Just like Nobody wants a cookbook that reads like a Stephen King novel. Nobody wants a, a one-liner that requires you to define an entire elaborate class structure and yada yada yada. It makes the language design a little bit harder. It's really easy to say, well, here, you do it this way. There, done. I don't have to think about it any further, that's it. But you have ten different ways to do it. You have to keep through each one of them and decide what's the most way to do each one. But it's fun. Adaptability. Language change is a natural thing. It's as natural as a hair going in your head. All languages. Get personal. I'm 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 not saying anything about hair on your head. I didn't know, but. Now, languages change because the needs of the people who are using it change. You know, we have we are solving very different problems today than we were solving 20 years ago. So the same kind of language that we used 20, 30 years ago is not the same kind of language that we need today. So they they change to stay relevant to the needs that we have. Now, if you have a dead language, it's not going to change. That is. Nope. If nobody's using the language, then there's no need for it to change. You don't care. The best way to tell a language is completely dead is if there are no compilers or interpreters that will actually run it anymore. Okay, with Parrot, we're going a really long way to make sure no language has reached that new set point, but I'll talk about Parrot next week. Uh. Now, our, so our design trick is to try to not just say, okay, change is normal, but actually try to make it easier for the language to change over time. 
So we're building in a few features like we're going to make it really easy for you to modify how the source code is parsed by doing all the parsing in a Perl 6 grammar, which is sort of a next generation of regular expressions. Regular expressions on like steroids. And all you have to do is swap in a different grammar and your source code will parse differently. Very handy. For some of us who like player tricks. <laughs> We're also lowering the distinctions between built-in features and user-defined features. Uh, because you'll find over time that what somebody just kind of created as a little add-on for the fun of it will suddenly become extremely useful that everyone must have. So try to make it natural progression. And just trying to make it a little easier for you know, user defined operators and other things like that to be added in. is hmm. if you're looking at the world around you, you're not going to see everything sort of in a, in a, just a blur. Some things stick out more than others. So our trick is to try to use that to help the programmer, both to help the programmer use the language and then also to help the programmer help the people who are going to have to use code. Or her code. So in the original Perl, we had things like the begin blocks, which are all caps, to say, hey, I'm outside the normal flow. I run like before anything else. Pay attention. And we have a whole bunch more of those now. Uh, next blocks and last blocks and pre blocks and post blocks and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Fun stuff if you want to play with it. And then Perl also had um, the modifier forms of some of the structures. So you can say, if something, do something. Or you can flip it around and you say, do something, if something. And what that does is it gives the programmer the freedom to say, well, this is the most important part. I want you to focus on this, so I'm putting it first. So if blue is the really important part, and what you do is just on the side. You can flip it around. Of course, that makes it pretty tricky when you're trying to decide how to design the language, right? Because you have to not only figure out, you have to figure out, kind of put your mind into the program and figure out what kind of things he's going to be doing. You know, what are people who use the language going to be doing? How are they going to need to manipulate things to make it clearer? Yeah. Um. Why do you have the brackets around the if for the next year? I mean, it's the only language I know like that. You don't do that in C. Brackets around the if? Yeah. Well, after the. You end. mean the parentheses? They're not required anymore. Not, not, no, they're totally brackets. Oh, the brackets. For the whole line code. Okay, I know that I'm allowed to do that in the C code, but I never do it. Okay. Because when I do it. Makes it hard to read. Yep. A lot of auto embedded editors will, will uh, add that automatically as well. Yeah. And it also is the kind of thing that bites you in the butt when you're maintaining your own code. Because you come back and you add another line and you don't think about the fact that you didn't have the closing bracket there at the you end. You don't do it on the other one. There are two brackets. Because um, in Perl, when you have the modifier form where it sticks on the end of the statement, yeah. you can only have one statement because it's actually part of the statement. There are no brackets. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> you can also just use plain blocks now. Plain brackets on anything. That's what go to is for, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yes! If I were go to, man. I think we actually got rid of go to's. I'll have to go back and check the set. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> We give you all sorts of other evil things. You don't need to go to anymore. Anyway, um, this is kind of an interesting principle um, based on linguistics. So, in natural language, we tend to stick lengthy bits on the end, right? 
to say I gave Mary the book, or I gave the book to Mary, but I gave the book about the history of the development of peanut paste products in Indonesia to Mary. It does not sound right. You say I gave Mary the book about blah, 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 blah. So the reason is that when your brain is trying to parse this long sentence, what you do is you start cutting off the blocks of the sentence, and then you get this really long section that's, that's really just a, a minor part. It's not something you need to worry about. And then you get back to like the object of the sentence. So your brain has to do this sort of detour route and come back. Very hard on memory. You have, humans have a very limited capacity for that kind of parsing memory. Now, the same thing is true when you're trying to read code, right? So, in this section here, you read along, read along, the regular expression, right? Da 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 And then you get to the end and you say, oh, that's a case insensitive regular expression. Let me go back and see what it was actually going to do. Da 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 And the parser has to do the exact same thing. So, it's harder for humans and it's harder for the computer. So we're just going to flop that around a little bit. You know, we'll just write it We made a few other changes too, but, you know, you can make more of those. Go in. Does anybody know what go is? Do what I need done. Yeah. Got it. It shows up a lot on the language list. In the process on your list. So, here's the thing about when features. I mean, you want the language to just do what it wants to do. You don't want to have to think that. <coughs> you want to. Now, the problem with this is, of course, that do what I mean is not always do what you mean, or what you mean, or what you mean, but in general, <laughs> you want to try to make the language so that when someone is coding in it, they go along and they, they it seems natural, right? So defining like pages and pages of rules of how a particular keyword works is never going to have the same power as if people just look at the keyword and they think, oh, of course it does that. I mean, yeah, look, it's given, right? So, of course. With Prostix, we have a few eyes that we're targeting in our, in our Dwin. Uh, one is, of course, pro programmers. Uh, we want people who have been programming in Pro for a long time to look at Pro 6 and think, okay, here's a new thing, but yeah, it fits right in. You know, I, I expect it to act this way. Another group we're targeting, maybe less obviously, is English speakers. But not necessarily, we're targeting native English speakers because that's the majority of our users. But you have to be careful because some features in English are very, very unfriendly to people who are non-native English speakers. So in regular expressions, we have a little modifier that says only grab this number one, only grab the first one or the second one, third one. So, what we've done is we actually give two different forms of these. We give the natural form, first, second, third, with the funny chaotic endings that English likes to use. And then we also give a generic form that anybody can use. And you don't have to remember, now let's see, when you have the three, and it takes this ending, and then you have the... So you kind of go both ways. Borrowing. Now, natural languages do this all the time, right? We go over, we steal a word, camouflage, champagne, tortilla, lasagna. But we don't steal it exactly like it was in the original language. What do you mean, like faux pas? Faux pas, yeah, that's the one. So, like, the original French was camouflure, and it missed something, I don't even know what it meant. It had nothing to do with already bringing 
patterns on like cloth. But we stole it from them. We used it. We changed the way it sounds. And the same things for programming languages. So there are plenty of there are plenty of languages out there who experiment and with strange little solutions to various different problems. So you might as well go ahead and take what they've already designed and use it. Now, it's a very respectful thing to say. Hey, small talk, you did a great job at developing this OO stuff, so we're going to borrow this and this from you. And it makes a lot more sense to openly say, hey, we're borrowing this from you, than to try to pretend that you invented it. Or, even worse, to refuse to use it because you didn't think of it. I've not seen that before. <laughs> Maybe no names. But because every language has a different syntax and different structure and a different direction, different set of problems and solving, the, the features that they have are not going to fit into our language just pulled straight. So the same way when you're borrowing a word from French into English, you change it. If you were borrowing features from small check to pearl over the first one, I'd love that name fit. It would be exactly the same, but equivalent. I think you're going to happy there. Um, one of the things that people have said over and over and over again when we decided to sit down and redesign pearl is it has to still be pearl. Well, of course it has to be so far. But what does that mean? <laughs> it's a big <laughs> Yeah. You anything to lose. Because, okay, now a redesign of language is not going to have exactly the same features as the original language. It's not going to have exactly the same syntax as the original language because if it did, it would just be the original language. There's no point to redesign it to nothing. But some of the things that we can identify that, that do make the language what it is. Larry originally intended that Perl would make the easy things easy and the hard things possible, right? It has to be light and flexible, but it also has to have solutions for complex problems. So we're still targeting that same zone. We're just going to make the easy things a little bit easier and the hard things a little bit more possible. It also has to be familiar to Perl 5 programmers. When they jump into this language, it has to feel like Perl. So the basic syntax is pretty much the same. You can clean it up a little bit. It's, it's actually nicer. But it still has to be Perl. We're also going to make it mechanically translatable. Now, that really isn't going to mean much to anybody five years down the road. But when 6.0 is first released, it makes a big difference. You know, Perl has always stuck with the philosophy of, you know, learn enough now to get your job done, and then learn as you need it. So learn enough about Perl 6 to, you know, figure out where it's broken when you try to translate it. But you don't have to learn every nuance of every feature to keep the code running. Another consideration. We could have made a quick fix in a couple of months that would just patch a few features and keep it running for a couple of years. But uh, we decided that it would make more sense to plan ahead and plan not to have to make this kind of change again for a really long time. Yeah. Pearl 5 has existed for? Pearl 5 came out 5.0, 95. I think. Yeah. It's time. Pearl 5 was a little patch. Had objects. And it was slightly clumpy. <laughs> okay, major clumpy. I'll give you that. So we're not interested in whatever the latest. Ooh, this is cool. Fat is. And we're not interested in adding a few, like, 
exciting tricks that you can do. We're really only interested in building dependable tools that you will use for a really long time. That you might not use them if you don't like Perl, but that people can use for a really long time. And nobody's pretending that we're going to spend all this time and come out with something that's absolutely perfect, the perfect language that everyone must use. It's just progress. It's just evolution. <coughs> so, we're trying to make a language that is adaptable, freeing, simple but complex, distinct but consistent. It has to borrow, uh, but purposely. It has to be relevant now and then. It has to be programmer friendly. But most importantly, it has to be even more pearlish than Pearl 5 is. I apologize if we covered this one. I stepped out for a cigarette. But, um, I mean, there were a couple of cases, and I can't remember now, but where you had taken the reserve word and split it into two separate new reserve words. Is that going to cause any backward compatibility problems? If you say go to the compiler. You mean if someone happens to be using a subroutine named try and so we now eval in both instances. All all it'll mean is that if they call try within the, the code that they define to try in, they will get their try instead of ours. So they'll just be they'll just be over overloading that that subroutine. Question is, uh, is your question whether all Perl 5 code will still work? That's a fair question to ask, but I guess that's what I'm asking. No, we will break backwards compatibility in some cases, and that's why we have to provide mechanical translation for those cases. Yeah? What can you tell us about Mason and uh, PHP, PHP summaries for any language? He wants to compare PHP to Mason, which is a set of modules that do uh, template for and uh, for websites. Um, have you looked at template toolkit? Because if you're if you're doing web development in Perl, you probably want to look at template toolkit over Mason. It's a lot more like PHP. Um, I, I have heard a lot of people saying that. Pearl is losing the web market, which really isn't all that terrible since it never stopped the web market in the first place. <laughs> but um, it is something to be concerned about, I guess, but I don't really mind. I mean, I, okay, I'm quite a pragmatist when it comes to languages, so I'm happy that PHP is getting some market share. That's cool. They're probably never going to be used on Wall Street. They're a very different language, but for the web stuff, they've, they've got a peg. So, hey, kudos to them. What is the market that you see like Pearl targeted at? Pearl is hmm, Pearl is the chameleon language. It's used on the web, it's used in shell scripts, it's used for major financial applications, it's used for GUI applications, it's used for... And some of that will become... When we move to Parrot, Parrot is the new virtual machine that's going to run in Pearl 6. And actually, it's going to run Pearl 5. Um, there's a, the Pony Project is now porting Pearl 5 to run on 
compare. Um, so it will actually have like direct access, direct access to SDL libraries within uh, the virtual machine, which will give mean that Perl can actually, you know, at this point, Perl kind of runs GUI apps on Linux. It, it, it's kind of a fluke. It does it, but it's 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 easy. Um, so by moving forward the way we are, it, we're actually going to give Perl access to more of the market. But I don't think we'll ever dominate in any market. That's not really what Perl's about. Yeah? Um, well how exactly, you, you admitted that uh, object-oriented programming in Perl was a little clunky. Um, what is that, how is that different in Perl 6? Perl 6 is completely different. But we'll, we'll still let you do your little clues. Well, I don't want to. I want to know how I can do it right. Um, the Perl 6 model is much more like what you would expect from small talk. It's got true opaque objects. Uh, one of the annoyances of Perl 5 objects is there is absolutely no way to protect your object. So any data, any subroutine in your object can be called from outside. No such thing as public right. Um, so we have that now. Uh, we'll also have real attributes in the objects instead of just having a little hash that we kind of pretend is attributes. Uh, it's 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 some really cool stuff. We've been having design meetings for like the last year. You know, every few months we'll meet up, and it's really really cool stuff. Hopefully, there you'll have actually the apocalypse finish in the next six months. That would be cool. Considering that, like the Java virtual machine, one of the biggest complaints is that it's slow. What what made the Perl Foundation decide to go to that model? Because they're doing it completely differently, and it's a whole heck of a lot faster. Uh, we're actually using a register-based virtual machine rather than a stack-based virtual machine, uh, which gives us the advantage of years of research into hardware register-based uh, machines that we can that we've actually been taking advantage of. And we run tests. There have been some very basic you know, like MOS tests of Parrot. And it's running at close to C speeds, which is pretty shocking for yeah, for a virtual machine. Yeah, interpreting by two. So, other question. Question on the Will it support other scripting languages such as Ruby or Python? Well, the question is, will Parrot support other scripting languages? Yes. Uh, we're definitely targeting Ruby and Python, and we hope to run Java bytecode straight. There's been some work done on that. Um, there's currently a very basic fourth interpreter. There is a defunge interpreter. There's a brain fuck interpreter. There is a. <laughs> 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 yes, somebody's been doing that research. It does have a new interpreter. <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's actually a contest on right now with Guido next year. There will be a Python contest. Well, not really. Whoever can manage to run some sort of Python code faster, whether it's Parrot or the, Py or the Python interpreter, will get to throw a pie in the face of the other language. <laughs> That's what we say, but, you know. Somebody had a question back there before I went off on pies. I'm too drunk and I forgot it. Uh, yeah. It has nothing to do with that interpreter that involved the word fuck. Brain <laughs> fuck. It's a language. Now, I know you're talking about Perl, but you brought a brain fuck the language. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you gotta see it. Well, I know what, I know what, what, what ook is, alright? Brain fuck. Look it up. Look it up. Just do a Google search on brain fuck.
to, to go compete against Microsoft? Um, no, not really. I mean, we're not really. I don't see this competition. I mean, is, is Microsoft going to care about really the scheme? Really? No. Um, but there is, I mean, you've seen the Mono Project, right? Okay, yeah. Look at the Mono Project if you're interested in C-Sharp on, on Windows. I mean, on Linux. I'm not really interested in C-Sharp on Linux. I was just hoping the Pearl was going to kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, there, um, in my other role as Pearl Foundation President, I've actually been negotiating with Microsoft the last few months over licenses on whether they can run Pearl on a CLR. Because they want to, they want to write their own version, but oh. they want to own the copyright. Oh. <laughs> we have trademark. Sorry, guys. Anyway, yeah. Feel free to not answer this question, but I'm kind of curious about how this works. Is it is the Pearl development mostly a volunteer effort, or do you guys have funding, or you know, is it grant funded? You know, how is it? How is it's it? it's primarily volunteer. Yeah. Uh, like 99 percent of it. Through the Pearl Foundation, we were able to fund um, about seventy thousand dollars worth of Pearl development work, but that is just a scratch on the surface of what people are doing. So, you know, people complain about how the Pearl Six is going, but when you think about the fact that people are doing it on nights and weekends, it's actually going to pass. Yeah. All right, so Pearl, maybe one year ago. <laughs> 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 None that I know. Three at least, Larry Wall. He won at least three times. Woo! Good for Larry. Probably. I have, I have to confess, I have never looked at the statistics for the obfuscated C contest. Who is it? The important issue here is you bring up. <laughs> I will go back to these issues and topics. Yeah, sorry. I'm just a boring old language designer. Very, very pretty. Anybody else? Okay. You need a long alcohol break this time.